Hello, and thank you for joining our webinar on emergency response and active shooter. My name is Danny Riley, and I am the executive director for business development overseeing the Northeast here at Planned Companies. I'd like to present our presenter today, Demi Ann Little. With over 20 years combined experience in law enforcement and private and corporate security, Demi joined Planned Companies in 2016 as an operations manager for our security and front desk divisions. She was recently promoted to her current role responsible for the field training and development of all planned companies in 2021. Demi has knowledge and training as a first responder and volunteer firefighter, as well as trained in law enforcement from the NJ Police Training Commission. Demi holds many certificates in these fields, as well as experience as a responder for the 9-11 terror attacks at NYC. And now please welcome our presenter, Demi Ann Little. Take it away, Demi. Thank you, Danny. Thank you for your introduction. I appreciate the um, wonderful words. And uh, this is a very important topic. This is a very important topic that we're about to discuss. I hope that I can um, give you some information and, you know, help you better in these um, tough situations when there's fire and police uh, involved in a disaster. Um Obviously, we just had our introduction, so we are going to go through a couple of different things. What's the uh, disaster versus an active shooter? Fire and police have different types of um, roles. We'll give you some examples. We'll give you some ideas of what to do with some of this uh some of these catastrophic events, and then also what to expect as far as other roles um, and, and and as other responders during these situations. So we'll wrap up with a couple things in mind. If there's any questions, please feel free. Um, if you have any questions ahead of time, if you can hold them until the end, kind of write yourself a little note. And then once we are uh, open, we hope to answer any of your questions and get any feedback that you may have. So let's get started. First thing we're going to go through is fire versus the police in a disaster. So a lot of people do not understand that fire and police have very different roles and have different things that they do. All you see as a person at a event or a catastrophic um, occurrence, an incident, a fire, all you see as uh, the witness or the person involved is an emergency responder. What we want to make sure that you understand is that the, although they are emergency responders, they have different roles. So what are those roles? Well, in the role of the fire service, they are the linchpin of the disaster response. Fire water emergencies. Currently, you know, we see weather events that are large scale hurricanes. Yes, we've had them. So your fire service is really going to be the first and foremost um, responder. And it's, as I said, the linchpin of disaster response. The fire chief, or the senior line officer is the person that is charged with the operational management of the response effort. They are the one in charge of the scene. Just because you see a police officer or you see an EMT, um, you may see FBI, you may see um, federal agencies. There is always a commander, a fire chief, a senior line officer that is your command, right? So that's where your command post is and that's where everything is going to be uh, handled and managed from. And they are going to get out to any of those police officers or emergency responders. So with that, you know, you see a lot of, a lot of different people, right? So in a disaster area, the fire service's first duty is to save the people and the animals. You know, you as um, a witness, you as somebody that may have been involved in this, you're going to see somebody, you're going to ask for help if you're injured. But understand that the fire service is first and foremost the person that is looking to save life. Th that, is, that is the biggest thing that they're doing first. 
right? So firefighters are also going to put out the fires. They're going to conduct the tests. They're going to look for hazardous substances, make sure that in area there's no structural damage because they can't send you back into a building that is unsafe. So those are all things that are going to allow a safe return from you during any type of incident, whether it's a fire alarm all the way down to a five alarm fire or a major catastrophic event. We have to, as the fire service and the scene commander make sure that everything is safe before we let anybody else. And that's also including other emergency responders. We're not going to send police or EMT into areas that are unsafe. The police service has a very different role than the fire. So in the police service, they're the ones that ensure that the fire, ambulances, EMTs, paramedics can do their job. They're the ones that are going to close off an area. They're going to direct traffic. They're going to be the ones that are going to be crowd control and make sure that nobody is trespassing in areas that have been deemed unsafe or haven't been checked yet. They're going to be your source of information. They may not have the answers. They may not be able to give you answers, but If you were to go up and ask them for something, you are going to be able to be directed in the right area or even told, I'm sorry, we don't have any information just yet. But as soon as we do, we will make sure that there is um, word that has been communicated to you. They're also responsible for deployment of disaster identification teams, large scale events, Um, whether it's a, you know, 9-11 type uh, type tragedy or um, a hurricane where there are people that are missing, where you have um, active shooter events, they're responsible for identifying anybody that either A, is missing or B, unfortunately has fallen to um, whatever the, the, the tragic event is. Um, so th- they have to make sure that the right people get in for that too. Again, federal agencies, um, coroners, medical examiners, and so on. So realistically, in a very large scale event, you're looking at two very, very important entities, but both have two very, very important jobs. So a real world example, we have 9-11 and we know, um, you know, it is still 21 years later, something that is very, very fresh on the minds of many, many Americans, as well as many people throughout the world, because it was a very, very large, sad, tragic event. But for our purposes, there was a lot that happened during 9-11. There were a lot of things that we learned as emergency responders, as federal agencies, as uh, police officers, that you don't want to do going forward. We learned that, you know, we have this thing called 10 codes. Well, each diff- uh, each municipality or the fire service and the police service had different 10 codes. So what did we do? We said basic English. Let's use basic English. Instead of saying 10-4, you said received your message. So we made sure that we went back to that basic standardization of talking. And that's one of the big things that 9-11 taught us. What else did they teach us? Well, as a fire personnel, FDNY, or any of the emergency services, we had a very specific role. As somebody who did respond to the 9-11 attacks as a um, New Jersey firefighter at the time, we had an escort in and we had to stage in certain areas. But our roles were very, very different than what everybody else was doing. The fire role in a large scale uh, incident such as this, is to enter the building to provide the directives to help with evacuation. They were still evacuating buildings, unfortunately, when these buildings collapsed. So they want to make sure to get everybody to safety. They're checking the buildings, whether there's any safe areas. Um, If there's fires, they're putting out fires. You know, obviously you're not going to get a fire hydrant from, you know, 
the 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 ground or the street level all the way up to 110th floor. So there's ways that you had to bring equipment up. So they had a very, very different role. Where in the police role from a 9-11 style emergency, the police aided with the evacuation. If the fired personnel were up on the 10th floor or 50th floor or 100th floor and they were sending people down, you're going to find police in the lobbies. You're going to find the police in exterior um doorways or or anything that's going to go perimeter doorways anything that's going to go to the street right we we always see that there's exit doors so you're going to find the police where they're in an area to further direct you to a safer area a staging area okay you're evacuating from such and such a building your staging area is over here and you know they'll tell you the directive to make sure you go Please leave your name, contact information, because we still need to make sure that you are identified and you are accounted for when a scene is either cleared or we get into the next phase. So police is very um, safety oriented and and they were handling the um the crowd part of things. They were also, again, standing in areas that needed to be um cordoned off or you know so no trespassing was allowed so where you would see a police officer more on a lower level on a ground level in those outskirts of the building the fire department was up there doing what they needed to inside the building so sometimes that's kind of what you need to th- think about fire is out or i'm sorry fire is in police are out you know that's important to understand Fire is out. Fire is in. Police is out. In a real world example, again, we had the uh, Surfside condo collapse in Florida. Another very sad, tragic event, something that could have potentially been, um, you know, it's something that could have potentially been avoided, but unfortunately it wasn't. So What are the differences here? Well, now there's a little bit of a difference because you don't have a building to go into, right? You don't have a building at this point to evacuate. So now your fire department becomes your search and rescue. They are still going to enter the rubble or enter the areas to look for life, right? You're still looking for animals. You're still looking for um, people. So, yeah, you're not entering a building, but you are still entering the area to look for that life. The police role in a situation like this is very sim- um, similar. You're going to have the primary role, crowd control, secure, and block off the areas. Of course, you know, people are going to be walking by. They want to take pictures. They want to take photos and videos and do, you know, all those types of things. So the police are going to be there to, you know, tell you to respect the privacy of what is going on on the scene, but also make sure that nobody puts themselves into an unplaced area or situation because um, a building like this or a collapse like this, the whole ground at that point is unsafe and unstable. On another note within this, In will come a whole nother type of team where the fire department's role is still search and rescue and be able to, um, you know, look for that life. You're going to have an actual search and rescue team that comes in. This could include fire personnel. This could include police personnel. These could include federal search and rescue teams, as we even saw in the Surfside condo collapse. This included... We had a, um, a, a, a a search and rescue team that came from Israel and wanted to help out and help look for um, either survivors and or just some sort of um, physical being so that they could make sure that um, they were accounted for one way or another and they got the um, proper aftercare they deserved. So a search and rescue team will conduct the thorough search of the lost or missing people or animals. They will render an aid 
or evacuate the living to recover these bodies as well as recover the bodies of the deceased. So obviously, you know, they're looking for just about anything. They are going to get into that rubble. Going back to when we talked about 9-11, everybody became a search and rescue person at one point in time. I can remember being at ground zero three days after the towers collapsed. Every single one of us, whether you were an NYPD uniform, whether you were a volunteer uniform, or whether you were just somebody that was trying to volunteer to help out, everybody there was search and rescue. But of course, because in situations like that, you can't just up and say, all right, I'm, I'm going in. No, you know, you got to make sure you have the proper approval. You have to also be accounted for because we don't ever want anything to happen to somebody like that. So although everybody always wants to help, make sure you have the proper training and the proper authorization from the correct fire commander, chief of the scene in order to be able to um, go and volunteer any type of work. Those are, you know, catastrophic events where you have and you see everybody trying to work together and you see everybody trying to um, do what is best for the cause uh, at that time. Another one of the biggest topics that we talk about, we continue to talk about, unfortunately and sadly daily, are active shooter events. Active shooter has become something that we talk about more than we ever wanted to think about. But we also want to talk about it and we want to train about it and we want to know what we should do in case this ever happens to me, right? We can have that mindset. No, not me, not my workplace. My workplace is great. Everybody gets along. No, I trust, you know, nothing will ever like that happen in my community or my children's school. But unfortunately, we cannot control the unknown. So all we can do is we can do what is best to train ourselves and prepare ourselves in the event we are ever put in one of these situations. Active shooter. We have statistics with active shooter, right? So a mass shooting is defined as three or more persons that are shot in one incident. That doesn't mean, you know, somebody comes into a residential complex as a targeted shooter. They go, you know, they shoot a resident and they leave. That is not considered an active shooter. An active shooter includes multiple people shot at one incident. If a perpetrator comes in with the intent to shoot one person and then ends up shooting multiple on their way out trying to escape, then it becomes an active shooter event. So we're not talking about intent. It's really just the um, the the cause and amount of what happens during the event. So as of September 2022, there have been 508 mass shooting incidents in the United States. That is big. We would like to have zero. Unfortunately, 508 in nine months is heartbreaking. Primarily a U.S. phenomenon, the U.S. has 5% of the world's population, but we um, have 30% of all mass shootings. That's a staggering number. 2,089 have been injured in the mass shooting events uh, of this year, with a total of 545 people that have been killed. That is a total of 2,634 affected people just in the first nine months of 2022. And let's face it, that is not going to get any lower. The way we are seeing things, we are just seeing these numbers raise year after year after year. Active shooter statistics continue with 69% of incidents are over in five minutes or less. 
So that means 2,634 people were affected within five minutes of an active shooter starting or or, um, creating an event on their property. Nearly half ended in two minutes or less. So although 69% of these ended in five minutes, half of those 508 events were over in two or less. You don't have the time to think. You don't have the time to um, react. So what do we do? We want to train you on what is the best way to think and react once you hear something or see something or think that something is off. 60% of incidents ended before the police arrived as well. Whether that's because the shooter was disarmed and um, deceased by the time police arrive, whether it's because the shooter um, took their own life, you know, there could be reasons why something happened. You know, maybe something happened when um, they were going through and and they got injured, and you know, it was it was a fatal injury. So. Um, 60 of these incidents ended before the police arrived. Police arrived after the attack. So when the police arrived after the attack, the attacker had either fled or they had killed themselves. I had just mentioned that there could be multiple things. Look at the amount, 26.1% had fled before the police arrived. The subdued, they've uh, subdued the attacker or shot the attacker. Not a very high number there, but still, you know, that's a lot of courage. And it takes somebody a lot to be able to do that. If the police arrive during an attack, 22% of those, the police actually shot the attacker, were 7.6% the police subdued the attacker. So the bystander, actually, the number is higher than the police, but you don't know what's going on. You don't know. So don't ever put yourself in a situation where you're uncomfortable, right? If you are not comfortable acting, don't. Don't make somebody talk you into doing it, right? Because if they do, that could have tragic um tragic events as well. An attacker could have either killed themselves after the police arrived or they actually surrendered to the police. Notice how low that number is of somebody that surrendered. Anybody that's coming in that's going to create an um, active shooter event, they're not coming in thinking that they're walking out. I mean, they could come in thinking they're going to flee and not get caught. But realistically, they're going to come in and they're going to see that um, there's a uh, difference of, um, I got to start that over. Okay, we're going to go back. Well, Alfred, do you want to go back? I'm j- I just want to go back. I just want to start that one. Yeah, okay. That one slide over because right. the whole somebody, slide. N- no, 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 not this one. I'm going to start where I go into the next slide. Okay. Okay. Right, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm out. What do you mean? Oh, <laughs> you're out. I got going you. on mute. Okay. Got it. Um, okay. So, all right. <sighs> So let me advance. All right. So let me go back and start here. Okay. So after the active shooter, we see all of these statistics. 60% of the incidents ended before the police arrived. Well, what happened? What happened and where were those outcomes? If an uh, active shooter arrived after the... 
See, now I just, I lost my chi. All right, hold on. I'm going back. I'm starting over again. All right. We'll start here. <laughs> All right. So here's what I would do. I would do this slide. Okay. Click over the next one. Click over the next one. And come back to this one. No, no, no. Just click over the next one. And uh, then I would click once and then start talking so you see what where this is going i may maybe i put in too many clicks here and it's a little confusing okay right so, these are statistics after the police arrive yes the attacker either fled or killed himself yep or a bystander subdued him or killed him. okay and then if you click again you can see look uh, click well, click twice all right stop there mm -hmm. so you see here the bystander shot mm -hmm. attacker the asterisk so you didn't mention this, maybe you want to or not, don't want to, but the uh, who, who are the bystanders? Well, it was a citizen, a security guard, 1.6% of the time, or off-duty police, 0.7% of the time. See that? Yes, I did. I was actually going to go back to that at the end. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. I'm okay. going to mute. All right. Okay. So let me go back one. Um. Okay. So... The outcome of the active shooter attack. So after the police arrived, there are multiple outcomes that could have happened, right? So police arrive after the attack. At this point, the attacker either could have fled or they could have killed themselves. We also have where a bystander could have subdued the attacker or shot the attacker. If the attacker fled, look at that number is 26.1%. That is a very, very high number, especially in a situation where you may have a lot of people. Your bystanders here, right? They could take out the attacker. They can subdue them. They can shoot them depending upon, you know, what type of defense they may have or what type of um, uh, training they have. We also have what happens when the police arrive during the attack. So we have an active attack that is still going on, right? We saw this in multiple shootings where um, active shooters, where police were still arriving and they either couldn't locate uh, the active shooter or they could hear that the shots were still going and they were trying to find where the active shooter is. So if the police arrived during an event, 22.6% of the police shot the attacker, where only 7.6% subdued the attacker. That is small compared to a bystander that may have subdued an attacker um, before the police arrive. You also have the attacker where they may have killed themselves. And we have seen this. We have seen where they have killed themselves in some of these very large style um, uh, active shooter events. You also see the attacker, uh, the attacker surrendered themselves. This is where if the attacker surrendered themselves very rarely. That is the lowest number we see of them all. The highest number, the attacker actually fled. In here, there's a little area where it says the good guy with the gun. So the good guy with the gun is the citizen the security guard, maybe the off-duty police officer or military or, you know, you always hear, you always see about that guy that was off-duty in the bank that, you know, may have um, uh, gotten or subdued the attacker or was able to um, take out the threat. So in this case, the good guy with the gun, it's the citizen at 2.8% that has the best rate. The security guards, 1.6%. And we don't expect our security guards to engage in this type of activity unless either A, they're trained, or B, if they know that they are, are in imminent threat and, and trying to help out at a, uh, a scene. If you take a look at this active shooter incidents by state, this is our top 20 states, right? 25 of these incidents occurred in apartment buildings. As of August 12th of 2022, one in every 8.8 .8 days, there was an incident in an apartment building. Think about how many units are in apartment building. You can have units 
you know, as small as, you know, 20, or maybe you have ones as big as 200. Apartment and residential facilities are very, very different. And they have a lot of different, um, a lot of different people, a lot of different layouts. But this number alone is just a staggering. Texas, 249 active shooter events in 2022 so far. 219 in Illinois. And obviously, as you can see going down with Washington, even this being the 20th highest state, 46 events. You ask me, that's still 46 too many events. So what what is an active shooter, right? We can sit there and say he's the guy with the gun. He's the, you know, guy with the ax to grind. He's the bitter employee. Well, an active shooter is an individual engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a populated area. Workplace, schools, um, convention centers, clubs, movie theaters, we have seen it all. An active shooter event does not have any boundaries as to where it can occur. There often is no pattern or method as to how they select their victims. They walk into a building and they start shooting. Could they have a specific victim or a specific target in mind? They could. Maybe they're just disgruntled at the whole workplace or they're unhappy with their whole area that the, the building itself is the target. There is no pattern or method as to how they're selecting. They're just going in and trying to cause the most damage with loss of life. Most shootings are not classified as active shooter incidents. So even though when I mentioned earlier about the large scale um, active shooter events that we have has to have multiple people, it can't just be a one-on-one, -on -one, you don't necessarily hear it that way. It could be there was a bank robbery and three people were shot. Well, that could have actually been a ma uh, massive shooter incident. They are not always um, classified as active shooter. They could also be classified as any of these. Domestic violence, drug activity, gang activity is a big one, right? Oh, well, just another gang. Um, routine criminal incidents, bank robbery, I just mentioned that, a burglary, um, an armed robbery in a uh, residential building. And we've seen a lot of these active shooter events get classified as terroristic events as well. So keep that in mind that when you know what the actual uh, description of a active shooter event, just because it may be referred to as one thing does not necessarily mean that was what it was. How do we protect ourselves? We can run, we can hide, and we can fight. Those are the three best courses of action to take as a person. Option one, we can run. This is probably your best option when you can. You're not always going to be able to run as much as we'd like to. You're not always going to have that option. But if and when you do, run. Evacuate as possible. Um, if possible, know where your exits are. Know if you need to go up a stairwell to go down another stairwell out to a, a, a different door. Know how to get around your buildings. If there is an escape path possible, attempt to evacuate the premises. Be sure to have an escape route in mind. Evacuate regardless of whether others agree to follow. You do what you feel is best for you. Leave your belongings behind. I know, you know, women want to grab their purse. Men, you know, want to make sure you have your wallet. You want to, you know, make sure you have your phones. And if you can't grab it or you don't already have it in your pocket, go. Go without it. You are going to be better off because this is where once you think that hesitation could make or break your exit strategy. Help others escape if possible. If you have people that do 
want to escape with you and they're not going to um, hesitate and they're not going to, you know, take a while and, 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 oh, I don't know. Should I do this? Should I not do this? I want to hide. I want to, if they're ready to go, there is strength in numbers, help others escape and go together. Prevent individuals from entering an area where the active shooter may be. Listen for those sounds. If you hear that there are gunshots on the southwest side of the building, go to the northeast if you can. Keep your hands visible. Keep your hands visible at all times. By keeping your hands visible, if you see any law enforcement, if you see people you don't know, if other people are trying to evacuate and they see that you have bare hands, nothing in your hands, you are not a threat. Your hands being visible is very important to show that you are not a threat. Follow the instructions of any police officers. If you do come across any emergency responders, police officers, um, anybody in a uniform that you know is not a threat, follow their instructions. Do not attempt to wound, uh, to move wounded people. We all are human. We all have a heart. We all want to do the right thing. But sometimes we can't help everybody. By moving a wounded person could fatally wound them, could um, hurt them even more, could create more damage to that person. Yes, they're going to be begging you. They're going to be asking for your help. They're going to be crying and pleading with you. Tell them you will send help. That is the best thing you can do. And call 911. If you're safe, when you're safe, where you're safe, call 911. Don't call 911 sitting there as you're running out and you have the shooter in front of you, behind you, close to you, because they're going to hear you and they're going to auto automatically turn to you and start shooting in your direction. So you want to be as quiet as possible and get yourself to safety as quickly as possible when you can. You don't always have the ability to run, right? So sometimes all we can do is hide, hide and, and do our best to stay quiet. If evacuation is not possible, find a place to hide where the active shooter is less likely to find you. Hiding places can include out of the active shooter's view. Um, you can provide protection if shots are fired in your direction. Uh, a closed door, a um, filing cabinet. Something, if you can hide between a filing cabinet and a wall, do it. If you can hide between filing cabinets, do it. Some place where it's not going to be easy to find you and some place that can provide some type of protection. Um, don't trap you. Don't trap yourself. Don't restrict your movements um, to prevent the active shooter to from entering your hiding place, right? So if we're in a copy room and we shut the door and we can lock the door and we can hide between the photocopier and um, a, a table and we're cleared, we're quiet. Our phones are off, not even on vibrate because you can hear a vibration. You want complete and total silence. Don't move. Don't speak. Don't do anything. Lock a door. If you can get anywhere where there is a door, lock it. I know we, you know, don't even think about it because it's just close the door. Maybe, you know, we're closing the door. We're putting stuff in front of the door. So it's harder to open up that door. Lock it as well. Don't forget to lock the door. And blockade it with heavy furniture. Like I just said, you come in, you lock the door, put a photocopier, put a filing cabinet, move a desk in front of that door. Anything that you can do to block the door, a active shooter that's coming by is going to come by and they're going to feel, don't forget, their goal is to 
um, have as many fatalities as possible. Well, if they're going to come to a door that is locked that they can't get into, they're going to spend less time trying to get in there and more tra- more time trying to find somebody or find an area where they can find more victims and they can uh, open fire. So if you lock a door, yeah, they're going to wiggle it. They may like, you know, move it a little bit, but realistically, they're going to move on because it's going to waste too much time for them. If the active shooter is nearby, lock the door, silence your cell phone and your pager, turn off any source of noise, radios, televisions, cell phones, vibration, rate, um, um, handheld radios. If you're in a site where you walk, th- you talk through the walkie talkies, those need to be shut off. Hide behind large items, cabinets desks, uh, refrigerators, anything that you think you can get yourself behind that is going to help protect you. Remain quiet. I know I've said that a lot because it's important. If you're not quiet, You're giving up, you know, it's like playing hide and seek as a kid. You're sitting there hiding behind a chair and you start to giggle. Guess what? The seeker is going to find you very quick. That's exactly what an active shooter is looking for. Remain calm. It is easier said than done. It is always easier said than done, but you have to do your best to remain calm. Dial 911 if possible to alert the police of the active shooter's location. And if you cannot speak, leave the line open so that a dispatcher can hear it. They can hear it, right? They can hear what's going on. Your last option is to fight. This is when nothing else is uh, available. You can't run. All of your um, exit ways are blocked. You can't hide. So what do you do? You fight. Fighting should be used as a last resort and only when you are in imminent danger. You can act aggressively any way you need to. Punching, kicking, screaming, throwing items. You know, improvising weapons, pens, scissors, throw them. Throw them, you know, you want to hit your target. That's how you're going to fight back. Yelling, screaming, but commit to your actions. Don't hesitate. Because if you pick up a pair of scissors and you hesitate at throwing at them, they're not going to hesitate to fire back at you. Make sure that you have some sort of uh, active shooter plan in your building, in your residential facilities. There is a Department of Homeland Security active shooter plan, and it goes over exactly what I just mentioned, right? Run, hide, fight. This is something great. You can find this on a, um, you can find this on the website. You can go over um, any of these steps that we discussed. But again, call 911 when it's safe to do so. Run when you can, hide when you should, fight when it's necessary and you are in imminent danger. And if you have a group of people with you and you are forced to fight, I said it before, there is strength in numbers. You're going to have a better chance fighting somebody, but just because you may be just by yourself doesn't mean you shouldn't fight if that's the only way for you to do your best to come out of this. Even if you get hurt, Hurt is still better alive than not. An act, uh, effective um, emergency action plan shows a preferred method for report, reporting fires, reporting active shooter, reporting floods, any type of emergencies, right? An evacuation policy and procedure can have escape procedures, route assignments, floor plans, safety areas. We go into every building. Anytime you're at an elevator, you see evacuation plan. And there is a floor plan to help you uh, evacuate should there's um, should there be an emergency. 
It also has for uh, an emergency action plan, the information concerning local area hospitals. That's important. And then any type of emergency notification systems, right? So if there's remote remote locations in area, if there's local law enforcement, I just mentioned hospitals, any type of medical facilities, those are all great things to have in an emergency action plan if you do not have one already. Additionally, create your emergency action plan with your human resources department, training department, facility owners, operators, property managers, right? Any place that you go, we have all of these uh, management levels. Everybody should have the same type of uh, emergency action plan. And then also make sure you consult with your local law enforcement or emergency responders. They, You may come up with a wonderful action plan and then you go over it with your local fire department. They say, hey, this is great, but this would be better. So absolutely having the consultation with local law enforcement and emergency responders is important for plan A, but also in case you need a plan B. Law enforcement in the role of active shooter is um, where we talk about fire's role in a large-scale disaster. Law enforcement are your first people that are going to be entering a building. So in the event there is an active shooter, the police have the task. Locate, neutralize the threat. That is it. Their first task is not to locate and save life. And yes, as horrible as it's going to sound, they are going to enter a building and they are going to see wounded people on the ground that are begging for help. They're going to see fatalities and they have to keep going. Remember, there are multiple teams that are going to be coming in. You're going to have a team that is your first response team. They're locating and neutralizing a threat. Then behind them is when you're going to have a secondary team that's going to be able to help, um, wounded people or help evacuate others where needed. So that's important to understand that there's multiple teams. The first team will move from location to location and secure those areas until the threat is located. When responding to an active shooter, they are trained in what is called rapid deployment. They proceed immediately to the area where shots were last heard, and their main purpose is to stop a shooting as quickly as possible. I know, and I understand, and I know it's easier said than done, but I can say, if I'm somebody that's laying there on the ground, wounded, hurt, I want help, and I see somebody in a uniform, please help me. I'm going to be begging and pleading for help. They can't, but just remember there is a team that will be closely following them that will be there to help you. So a couple of things to keep in mind. Officers will be armed and loaded. That's important because they're not coming in unarmed. Do not approach law enforcement at any time. You're scared, injured. You're looking for direction. You're looking for help. You you want to give all of this information on what happened. But if you approach law enforcement without them directing you, they can then consider you the threat. So make sure you wait until you are directed. Remain calm. Follow directions when they tell you evacuate this way. Stand down. Stay here. Don't move. Listen to their directions clearly and know that somebody will be coming behind them. Always keep your hands visible. Put any personal items down, bags, briefcases of any kind. They may not know what you look like. They may not know what the active shooter looks like. They may not know who's doing what. So if you come and you have things in your hands and you have... um. Uh, a bag, you have a backpack, they can deem you a threat. 
They may not have knowledge of a full description. They may not know. Maybe they're all they're going to know is dark hair, male, um, light hair, short female. They don't know. So all they're doing is following the trail. And even after you've made it to safety, don't leave. Don't leave until you have given your name, given a statement, given whatever information they need, because this is going to be a large scale investigation. And we need to make sure that you're accounted for, that you've given whatever information you witnessed so that we can either properly, A, bring the person to justice if they were caught, or B, make sure and learn from these types of events to do our best so that it doesn't happen and we can continue to protect people. because. No matter what, in any type of tragic event, active shooter event, even weather-related events, your safety is our priority. Thank you.